Okay, welcome back. Now the demo that I'm going to do is a really cool experiment. This is known as the apparatus. Uh, it's known as the apparatus of measuring sound velocity. So the way that it works is that we have a function generator here on the right. It says apparatus of measuring sound velocity. The function generator uh, creates a sound wave, ultrasonic sound wave of very high frequency, right? It's 40,000. So you can adjust the frequency to whatever you like. Right now it's 40,000. I can go uh, as low as I can go as low as 37,000 uh, hertz sound frequency. So these are all ultrasounds, right? Ultrasonic sound frequency. So I can adjust the sound frequency to whatever I like. I can put it to whatever frequency I, I like. I can also increase the amplitude of the wave, increase the amplitude, and you can see that changing. Okay. So then one. One part of the signal output goes over here all the way to the left side. This is called the sound emitter. So it emits sound waves, right? And then the other one directly goes to the oscilloscope, right? To the Y channel of the oscilloscope. So it could go to the X or Y channel. It really doesn't matter. Okay, then what happens is from the other channel of the oscilloscope, I have a wire going to this, right? Right here. This is the receiver. Okay, so this left side is sending out ultrasonic sound wave, and then this receiver is receiving them. So let's kind of draw the schematic. Okay, so we've got the function generator. One of the function generators is going to the emitter. Okay, this is the emitter of the sound wave. Right, and then the other part of the function generator is going into the oscilloscope. Okay, so let's say it's going into the Y output of the the Y input of the oscilloscope, right? So the Y input of the oscilloscope reads the original sound wave, right? That is given off by the function generator. Okay? Then the other part of the function generator goes to the emitter, and then you got here the receiver, receiver, and then you got a wire from the receiver going into the X output of the oscilloscope, right? So then here's what happens. The, the, sound, the emitter emits a sound wave of a certain frequency dependent on what the function generator is giving. The emitter receives that, sends the signal to the X output, and then the function generator sends the original signal to the Y. Okay? So what is the condition for these two waves, the one that's going here and the one that's reaching here going to the oscilloscope versus the one that's directly going into the oscilloscope? What's the condition for the two waves to be in phase? Because originally the two waves are in phase, right? So what's the condition for the two waves to be in phase? Well, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the original distance when they are in phase, right? So how am I going to know when they're in phase? That's the other topic that, uh, that um, this uh, demonstration covers. This is the topic of Lesage's figure, right? So when you have two waves going into the X and Y input of the oscilloscope, one of the ways to plot them, if I push this button, one of the ways to plot them is to is to plot the what's going into the y axis and what's going into the x axis. This is called the x y mode of the oscilloscope. Okay, so basically you have uh, an x wave. Let's say x is equal to a sine of omega t plus phi one. And then y wave a sine of omega t plus phi 2. Imagine you have two trig functions with the same amplitude and same frequency, right? The frequency going into here is the same as the frequency going into here. Why? It's the function generator that is producing both waves, both frequencies, and both amplitudes. They have the same amplitude, the same frequency. But what's the difference? The wave that goes here go, goes to the emitter and when it comes here, it might be out of phase by the time uh, when the wave goes directly here, right? It might be out of phase. So the only difference between them is their phase. So now if I plot y versus x, right? y versus x, what kind of graphs can we get, right? If the two phase angles of the wave are exactly the same, if phi 1 equals phi 2, that means the two waves are in exact same phase, right? What kind of graph am I going to get if both of them are the same? Well, it's kind of like saying if both of them are the same, it's kind of like saying both of them are zero, right? 
So then what kind of graph are you going to get? Well, you're going to get a straight line because y and x will be directly equal to each other. They'll be in phase and you're going to get a Lissagius figure, right? Uh, where it's just a straight line. So you see, I can adjust this distance. So let's just put this at any frequency that we would like, any random frequency. Right now it's 38,827. I can adjust this distance between the receiver and the emitter, right? Uh, you need to make sure, first of all, that both of them are on the same setting. This uh, volume, this uh, volt per division control, put them on the same setting. Okay, so now I put them at the same setting. Okay, so now I can adjust the distance between them. You see here? Right now, I know that the two waves are in phase. See, the Lissagius figure that I am getting is a straight line. It kind of is very sensitive to small displacements. So then the wave that is going directly into the X output, the wave that is going directly into the, the, emit, the emitter and the receiver is receiving it, and then from the receiver you're going to the oscilloscope, when they're in phase, the Lissagius figure you get is a straight line, right? So right now they're in phase. So what I can do, there's a vernier caliper here on the top, a digital vernier. I can zero this, right? So it measures the distance from any reference point, point that you decide. So I can actually just zero it, right? So when is the next time when they will be in phase? When is the next time? So the initial distance doesn't really matter because I just set it equal to zero, right? The next time when they're in phase, I'm going to make them farther apart, right? This distance delta r, right? The tiny bit difference from the initial distance, right? The initial distance, I called it zero, so I, I don't really care what it is, but the delta r is the difference in the distance between the new final distance and then that reference point, right? When the difference in the distance is equal to uh, n lambda over 2, I'm going to get destructive interference, right? When the delta r is equal to n lambda, then I'm going to get constructive interference, right? So the next time I'm going to get constructive interference, that means the distance that I've moved is equal to a complete wavelength of the wave, right? So let me move it now. You see the Lissagius figure is changing. Circle. Then it's an inverse straight line then go back to a circle, then go back to a straight line. Okay? So something like right there. Okay? So I've moved now 8.71 millimeters. So delta R is 8.71 millimeter. So millimeter, uh, I'm going to change that to meters, so that's going to be 1, 2, 3, point oh, oh, eight, seven, one. So then I am one wavelength off, right, n lambda, so that n is equal to 1, right? We can use this as an experimental way of calculating the velocity of sound. So the wavelength is equal to the velocity of sound over f, so velocity of sound is going to be what? Okay, it's going to be the frequency times 0 0.00871, right? So you're, test, you're testing a lot of things with this simple device, right? You're learning about the delta R is n lambda over 2, the delta R is n lambda. You're learning about the Sages figures, right? And uh, you're also learning about how to test for the velocity of the sound and then compare it to the actual velocity of the sound in the air, right? So then let's multiply this by the frequency. So what was the frequency that is showing there? 38,564, about 38,565, uh, 38, let's say. Okay, that is close to the velocity of sound in room temperature, which is about 343. So if you were doing an actual lab with this, you would go to uh, 2n, right? You would find the next time when the Lissagius figure is a straight line, right? You can go like this, you see, keep going. The next time when it's a straight line, right? And then you find the next time and the next time. Keep doing that until you get a 
average uh, value for the velocity of the sound, and then you would average those out and then compare with the velocity of sound as given by the temperature equation, right? One, uh, uh, 331.4 uh, times one plus T over 273 to the square root power, right? Uh, now let's test the N lambda over two. When will they be out of phase by 180 degrees, by pi radians, right? So what, what's the Lissajous figure that we get if this is zero rads and this is pi rads? Right? So then what ends up happening, if one wave is completely out of phase with another wave by pi radians, that means they kill each other, right? So when we graph one versus the other, what do they give you? Right? So then you have here sine of uh, omega t plus uh, pi, that's equal to negative a sine omega t. Right? So therefore, when you graph y versus x, you get an inverse slope like this. This means that you're getting destructive interference. One wave is completely out of phase with another one. Now, when do you get the circle? The circle is not complete destructive interference. It means one wave is pi over two out of phase with the other one. So one is, uh, one is a cosine, the other one is a sine. When one is a cosine and the other one is a sine, when you graph them versus each other, the Lissajous figure you get is a circle, right? So this one right here would be the two waves are out of phase by 90 degrees, by pi over two radians. But that is not destructive interference, right? The other way you can analyze them is to put this in dual mode. You see how the two waves overlap? The xy mode shows that it's a straight line. And you come out of the xy mode, you, you plot both waves at the same time. This means they're in resonance, right? Now, what would uh, inverse straight line be? You go like this. This would be pi radians out of phase. One is a sine, the other one is a negative sine, right? So now come out of the xy mode, you see? One is a sine, the other one is a negative sine. The peak of one meets the trough of the other. The peak of one meets the trough of the other. The peak trough. So what happens when those two waves combine? They kill each other. This is complete destructive interference, right? And then the xy mode shows you that it's a neg y equals negative x, right? So then what would happen with the circle? When would I get a circle? You see, there's a circle. The reason it's not a circle is because the amplitude of coming into both waves is not the same. So if I want to make it a complete circle, I can kind of play with the, the amplitude because since the emitter is further away from the receiver, the amplitude is kind of dying down. So you have to kind of play with the... Uh, the, the scale to make it look like a circle, but this is now pi over two radians out of phase. One is a cosine, one is a sine. When you come out of the xy mode, you can see here what, what is happening. So this means they are pi over two out of phase. Focus in on this, you see, where the, one of the waves, one of the waves is uh, going through the origin. That's the sine function, right? So this would be like sine. If I just plot the other one, the other one is starting at its max. The other one is a cosine, you see? The, the other one is starting at its max at here, and the other one is starting, is at the origin. So one, this one is sine, the other one is a cosine. When you plot them together, they look like this. When you go to the xy mode, right, it looks like a circle. So for our experiment, we don't need the circle, we just need the, the one that's going down. So let's go, to, uh, where, let's go to where it's a straight line this way right there, let's move it to the over, let's push the zero button, right now they're in phase, right? So how far do I have to go for them to be out of phase? Now I have to satisfy this condition for them to be out of phase, right? So then I move it slightly until they are out of phase by pi radians. That means the distance that I have moved is equal to half the wavelength of the sound wave, okay? Whereas before, the distance that I had moved was the wavelength of the sound wave, right? So then I can test to see if this is correct. Delta R, the measurement on here, is showing 4.59 millimeters. So 0 0.00459 millimeters, right? Then the N is one. And the lambda is equal to the velocity of the sound over the frequency. 
and then I have velocity of sound is equal to, then we have here twice the frequency. Uh, the frequency has kind of changed already, 38,573. So I'm going to use that frequency, 2 times the 38,573 times, uh, times the 0 0.0049, 0 0.00459. So I'm getting now 354.1. 354.1 meters per second. Now, if I wanted to, I could then take the average of the two results I got, right? Uh, 354.1 plus 335.9 divided by 2, I get 345. Velocity of sound, 345 meters per second. And then that seems closer to the value that we expect, the 343 meters per second for the velocity of sound at 20 Celsius. Right now in the room, it's a little bit more than 20 Celsius. It's about 25 Celsius. So I expect the velocity of the sound in the room to be about 345 to 350, okay? So the result I'm getting is good. So now I can do a lot more runs and get the average of all of those results. So now you can see a really good lab. You learn about constructive, uh, constructive destructive interference. You learn about Lusasia's figures. You learn about how to set up an oscilloscope and then analyze the sound wave and constructive and destructive interference. Thank you very much.